The David Pakman Show at davidpakman.com. Okay, the big news over the weekend, if you haven't heard it, Mitt Romney choosing Wisconsin Republican Congressman Paul Ryan to be his running mate as uh, uh, the part of the now Romney-Ryan ticket. It got off to a really bad start. Mitt Romney introduced Paul Ryan as the next president of the United States, taking no time in uh, starting to, as we hear, going gaff crazy. Let's take a look at this video. I love it. Very funny stuff. Now, some people will say, hey, President Obama did the same thing one time. Well, that's true, but Obama, Obama instantly corrected himself, whereas Mitt Romney left the stage and had to be told by uh, who knows who it was that had to tell him. And then he ended up uh, coming back and, and making the correction. Here is Mitt Romney introducing the next president of the United States, Paul Ryan. Join me in welcoming the next president of the United States, Paul Ryan. <laughs> <laughs> now, if you look here, I've seen this video, you can see that it, it appears to be one of Romney's aides, or maybe even his campaign manager, who goes up to him, puts his, and Romney puts his hand around his uh, shoulder, and you can tell that he's getting the message then. I don't know if we have that in the video. Uh, it's in this video. I've seen this clip. Oh, okay. Let's see. So here comes, we're now going over to Paul Ryan, making an incredibly patriotic entrance, of course. There are flags visible. Actually, there's a guy wearing a flag shirt, which is common, probably more at Republican events than Democratic, I would say. By the way, we should probably mention that the music is by Aaron Copeland, a gay communist. <laughs> is that a fact? That's a fact. All right, so there is Paul Ryan and Mitt Romney. So so where do we see that in the time? See, so yeah, no, it's just, after. Oh, okay, well, we don't have the rest of the clip. Oh, we just have the, the shortened version. Oh, you saw the wrong part. So there it is. Okay, uh, Mitt Romney making a gaffe instantly right away. And, you know, I have to say, I actually don't think this is just an innocent random mistake. I think this is a Freudian slip. I've been telling you for a while that I think it may be the case that Mitt Romney either never really wanted to be president and he kind of got pushed into this position by a number of different factors and or that he is deathly afraid of, God forbid, as he would put it, ending up president of the United States one day. I really think that there is more to that uh, verbal mistake. I disagree. I think it was just uh, Romney being Romney and and not uh, not having clarity, if you will. Well, listen, if you don't identify a chocolate donut as anything other, other than a chocolate goodie, it's possible that you would identify your vice presidential pick as the next president of the United States. Maybe that's what it is. I don't know. Or perhaps perhaps uh, Ram Romney. Whoa, now I'm messing up plans to uh, plans to. I don't know, fall ill after after winning office. Any number of possibilities for sure. And who knows? Last week, and for months, to be completely honest, I've been talking to you about the three factions of the Republican Party. We have the kind of pro-corporate, low taxes, pro-business side, which I think is the one that Mitt Romney is most genuinely a part of. We have the Tea Party faction, and then we have the religious right, kind of more extreme, uh, uh, evangelical, religious, social issues side okay now the paul ryan pick confirms that mitt romney agrees with us and with many other people who say that the tea party faction particularly as well as the religious right are not mitt romney's strong points okay i mean let's be honest the real mitt romney i know it's hard to know who the real mitt romney is right because he's taken every position on every issue i was going to say that today i'm convinced that well, we don't know anything about mitt romney my sense if i had to guess is that his his true self his genuine self is really in that first republican faction okay the the corporate pro business side he agrees he needs to make a play for the tea party religious right side and and the paul ryan pick certainly at least with the tea party side is making a play at that that's that's the reality lewis he's making a play at that let's not forget when we talk about that the Paul Ryan connection to Ayn Rand, okay? Because as we know, Paul Ryan obsessed with Randian philosophy and of course Randian philosophy believing basically in short that if you have made a lot of money, regardless of what you did to get there, by virtue of having figured out a way to have or make a lot of money, you are good, you are great, you are patriotic, you are exactly what this country needs. That is what Paul Ryan subscribes to. Yes, and also saying that, you know, a Ayn Rand was one of the main reasons he got into politics uh, for about 20 years earlier this year, maybe anticipating that he might be a VP candidate. He rejected that in an interview and said that his views are more closely aligned with St. Thomas Aquinas. <laughs> there you go. Well, so that, of course, then he's perfectly exactly who we want to be there. Number two, a heartbeat away from the presidency, isn't he, Lewis? Yeah, but he definitely needs to appeal to uh, the people that Ryan appeals to. But it is a safe pick. I mean, uh, 
I did say that I thought Bachman would be a brilliant pick, but I guess that was a little too risky. Risky for sure. Okay, so let's let's look at how was Paul Ryan vetted. Is he a safe pick? Lewis making a good point. What is what is the reality of this? Interestingly enough, the Romney campaign requested quote several years of tax returns from all vice presidential contenders. Several, assuming of course that when you hear several, it means more than two. Now, in a briefing with reporters in Virginia on Saturday, senior advisor Beth Myers, who was in charge of the VP selection process, didn't say exactly how many years of tax returns, tax returns were required, but she did say several were requested. By definition, I think that that means more than two years. That by, should mean to me that the Romney campaign realizes that to know who could be the VP, which of course the definition of the VP is someone who could assume the role of president at any time for any reason, you need more than two years. However, they don't seem to think that the American people need more than two years of Romney's tax returns to make that exact same decision. Right. No surprise, though. No, absolutely no surprise. What about the Paul Ryan budget, okay? As in many recent polls, the latest poll I saw about the Paul Ryan budget, very controversial budget, is a CNN survey. And it shows that the vast majority of respondents are not particularly thrilled with Paul Ryan's plan to end Medicare, replace it with a voucher system, so on and so forth. Only 35% say that they support the Ryan budget, 58% say that they oppose it. Now, among conservatives, which is really what we have to look at, what will the effect be on Republicans as well as conservative moderates? Among conservatives, 54% are still opposed to the Paul Ryan budget. Among seniors, who would not be affected by the changes in the Ryan Medicare plan, a full 74% are opposed, even after being told that Ryan's plan affects Americans 55 years of age and younger. Romney already distancing himself from this budget, okay? He said the Paul Ryan budget is not his, that he is putting together his own version of a budget of the Paul Ryan budget. Now, what would be the effect on Mitt Romney's income, okay, and Mitt Romney's tax base if the Paul Ryan tax plan and budget were to be put into place? Well, fascinating article in the Atlantic which says that Mitt Romney would pay 0.82% in taxes under Paul Ryan's plan. <laughs> you gotta love this stuff, Lewis. I mean, you can't make this up. No, it's incredible. I mean, cut, cut basically every uh, government program designed to help people uh, ever conceived. Right. And, uh, and, and make sure that wealthy Americans are paying as little as possible. Now, they wasted no time on yesterday's 60 Minutes interview saying we are not going to reduce taxes for high income people. A flat out lie. OK, that's a flat out lie. Let's look at the numbers. This is based on the 2010 numbers. And we have to go by the 2010 numbers because it's really the only recent year where we've seen a full tax return from Mitt Romney. We admittedly, Lewis, don't have many years of tax returns to work with here. Right. Based on the 2010 uh, uh, tax return. Mitt Romney would have paid about 0.82% under the Ryan plan instead of the 13.9% that he actually paid, which is already ridiculously low. Uh, uh, of course, less than Warren Buffett's secretary, is fair to say. Now, how could this happen? $21 million in income. How could you pay so little? Well, almost all of Mitt Romney's income in 2010 came from capital gains, interest, and dividends. Paul Ryan wants to eliminate taxes on capital gains interest and dividends. Just flat out eliminate it, Lewis. That's going to reduce Romney's tax pace, I'll say. Now, Romney did earn, he didn't earn very much, as he said. He had a little bit of on the side income in 2010, which amounted to $593,000 in author and speaking fees. That would still be taxed under the Ryan plan, just not that much. Ryan would cut that top rate from 35% to 25%, get rid of the alternative minimum tax. That would save Romney. It would save Romney almost $300,000 or so on his 2010 tax bill. So then what do we have? We have that small tax on the little $593,000 that he made speaking and author fees. He would still owe self-employment taxes on his author and speaking fees. That's about $30,000 more. Add it all up, he would owe $177,650 out of a taxable income of $21.5 million. That's a pretty cool rate of 0.82 percent. That's, I would love to pay 0.82 percent in taxes. I guess I don't make enough. It's funny because in theory in this country, when you make more, you pay a higher percentage in taxes. I don't make enough to only pay 0.82 percent in taxes. No, that is, that is an incredible tax rate. Um, 
Dave, we just really need to get the, the ball rolling here. And we here. need to make more money so we can pay less in taxes. Yeah. We're stupid. What are we doing? We really need to. I don't know what's going on here. As a Please Paul, become a member. Let, <laughs> <laughs> let's talk about whether Paul Ryan is even qualified to be vice president, which, of course, means he's qualified to be president by Mitt Romney's own standards. OK, now, is he a qualified politician? Is he an experienced politician? As a politician, Paul Ryan hasn't really done very much. He's only passed two bills into law in more than the last 10 years. In July of 2000, he passed a bill that renamed a post office in his district. Wow. Ambitious. Yeah. The other time was December of 2008, where Paul Ryan uh, passed legislation to change the way arrows, as in bows and arrows, Lewis, are hit with an excise tax. And it turns out uh, Ryan had a personal interest in this. He is an accomplished bow hunter. So those are the two bills that, that Paul Ryan has successfully seen pass. Now, let's say for a second that we don't care about what he's done as a politician because we care, like Mitt Romney has said he cares and Republicans have said they care, about Paul Ryan's private sector experience, right? That's what we've heard time and time again about what it takes to be president of the United States. By Mitt Romney's own standard, Paul Ryan isn't qualified to be president. He has essentially no private sector experience unless you count working at a, didn't he work at a McDonald's when he was younger or something like that? I don't know. How, how old is he? He's in his 40s, right? Yeah. And he's been he's been a politician for like 20 years. He's been a politician for a long time. Yeah. So, ladies and gentlemen, by Mitt Romney's own standard, Paul Ryan is completely unqualified to be president of the United States, which is ultimately the question about the vice president. Could they be a qualified president in the event that anything were to happen to hey, the president? Hey, one one month as as VP under Romney, you'll have all the experience you need. There you go. Of right? course, instantly you yeah. would. Now, uh, let's not underestimate the fact that Ryan, Ryan and Romney, Romney and Ryan, however, whichever order you think makes sense, um, that they could actually become the president and vice president of the United States. As ridiculous as those who are clear thinking, logical, have a, any kind of semblance of logic and reason in their thinking, we know how absurd it would be if these two were elected. This is not the time to get complacent, Lewis, because they could win. Yeah, I, I doubt it, but it is a possibility. Paul Ryan, we are now getting more and more information Let's to talk about his character, that Paul Ryan traded stocks on insider information to avoid the 2008 crash. This is really no surprise to me that he would use his position as a congressman to line his own pockets. Bush's tre uh, uh, secretary, tre uh, Treasury Secretary Henry Paulson met with Paul Ryan as well as with Federal Reserve Chairman Ben Bernanke on September 18th of 2008. Now, the purpose of the meeting was to disclose the coming economic meltdown and basically help Congress to pass legislation to help collapsing banks. What did Paul Ryan do instead of actually doing anything to help the collapsing banks? He decided to sell his stock in a lot of those banks and keep it and buy more of Goldman Sachs, which is the one that he was told by Paulson and Bernanke was not going to suffer the same fate. We actually have the uh, images here, which are incredible. Natan, let's figure out the best way to grab these. You can see from the 2008 financial disclosure from Paul Ryan uh, selling some uh, Citigroup stock, selling GE stocks, uh, uh, and as well, let's, uh, page two here is the one I really want to look at, selling JP Morgan Chase stock, selling Wachovia Corporation stock, but purchasing more Goldman Sachs Group stock. Now, what, what about this, Lewis? We need to find out more about this. Did Paul Ryan act on insider information to avoid personally losing money. This is a big deal, but maybe this isn't something Republicans care that much about. Maybe trading on insider information and taking advantage of your position as congressman is not that big of a deal to Republican voters. Well, you know, there is some gray area here. I mean, he, he, this meeting was not for that purpose. No, and well, he that's, did, he that's did, why I mean, it's not he did gray have, area. He did have access yeah. to, to information that could help him in a situation like that, but I mean, I, I feel like if that wasn't the intent and that wasn't the purpose of the meeting, then he's perfectly legitimate to use that information and to sell off your own stock. It's not. It's information it's not. that is not publicly available. And by definition, that means it is insider information. It is not information that you can legally be trading on. I mean, this is, again, not really what Martha Stewart ended up going to jail for. She ended up going to jail not for the insider trading, but for the obstruction of justice. But this is illegal. This is illegal if he is using information that is not publicly available to anyone. At the time he acted on it, it was not public information that the banks were heading into this incredible crisis. That's illegal. It needs to be looked into. If there were no specifics as to which banks, which companies were in trouble, does that still qualify? 
my understanding of the meeting is he was told uh, everybody but Goldman Sachs is in trouble. He mm -hmm. bought Goldman Sachs and sold all his other bank stocks. That's pretty cut, cut and dry to me. There it is. Okay, let's talk about my book recommendation for today. I'm actually going to recommend two books that I think make sense to read together. My book recommendations are brought to you in part by A Fashion of Bastards, Lewis, the best-selling satirical forecast of American politics circa 2015, praised as utterly hilarious, foreboding, and entertaining all at once. It's by Joanna Louise Johnson. You can find it on Amazon.com. My recommendation here, I know it's one that both of you have been looking forward to for quite some time, two books, both by Aldous Huxley. First, I recommend you buy Brave New World and you read that. After reading Brave New World, you get Island, one of the last books, maybe the last book that Aldous Huxley wrote, and you read that. Read them both in that order. Of course, Lewis, Brave New World, the dystopian uh, prediction of what they, the future may look like, and Island showing a more... I don't know, uh, I idyllic, utopian type of situation. Both fascinating books, huge commentaries on today's political landscape. I recommend them both, so please check those out. Tell me your thoughts about them afterwards, because I just finished reading Island myself. Let's take a break. We'll be back with plenty more after this. DavidPakman.com slash membership to get the bonus show. Stay tuned. The David Pakman Show at DavidPakman.com. Welcome back to The David Pakman Show. Welcome back to The David Pakman Show. You can support the show for free by doing all of your Amazon.com shopping through the black banner at davidpakman.com. Click it, bookmark it, use it every time you shop. That's it. It's simple, Lewis. Yeah, why not? I also want to say hi to today's new member of the day, made possible by liberalbias.com. Not only do we have liberals here on Earth, but now you have to worry about liberal bias in space. Distant galaxies are mocking conservative values and tricking scientists into believing that the universe is millions of years old. We know it's only 6,000 years old, Lewis. Of course. Find out more at liberalbias.com. Today's new member of the day, Frederick Walden. Frederick Walden, pleasure to have Frederick aboard with us. Of course, you can sign up at davidpackman.com slash membership. It's the best way to support the David Pakman Show. Remember when Mitt Romney said that, uh, well, he said a number of things, but over the last couple of years, he said everything from if he is elected president, every college graduate will have a job, to saying that he would create 500,000 jobs per month, which of course only happened five times in the last 50 years. It sounds like he's backing off of that a little bit, and this is really funny. Last week, Romney declared in his new one-page economic policy plan that the country would add 12 million new jobs by the end of his first term. Now, Lewis, does that sound like a lot to you or not a lot? Sounds, sounds pretty high. It sounds high. Yeah. Here's what's fascinating. Usually politicians get hammered for overstating how much the economy will improve under their watch, as we've been hammering, rightly so, Mitt Romney with his 500 jobs a month number. At least by some forecast, Romney's promises are completely underambitious because we're already expecting, based on economic indicators right now, to add about 12 million new jobs during the next presidential term, regardless of who the president is. Oh, okay. First term, four years. Exactly. For some reason, I thought you said first month. Here, the oh, 12 million jobs in a month would well, be something else. Well, we're talking about Mitt Romney here. <laughs> so you actually thought it, he was making yet another outrageous prediction. Yes. <laughs> Macroeconomic Advisors is projecting that the economy would add 11.8 million jobs from 2012 to 2016. Okay. Moody's Analytics is forecasting 11.8 million jobs from 2013 to 2016. So, frankly, I'm surprised that Mitt Romney didn't claim he would create the 12 million jobs on his first day. But if we actually take this to heart and say Romney would, would create this number of jobs in the, first, uh, in the first term, it really means he's going to do nothing. Because as we're already seeing from a number of economic uh, uh, pr forecasting firms, that's what we're going to see. The economy is in a recovery phase. And we're going to see that as a baseline during the next presidential term regardless of whether Romney does anything. So really what he's telling us is he will do nothing. His plan or, will have or absolutely is, no effect on the number of jobs that are going to be created. Or is the continuing recovery dependent on his presidency? Uh, I can't imagine that, that's, that he's even aware of these numbers when he makes that claim. 
Probably not. You do have to be living in a fantasy world, though, or just be deeply disturbed to use the slogan, believe in America for your campaign, when you dodge the draft by going to Europe, keep tons of money offshore, and outsource jobs to China. It's not really believing in America, so, so maybe we shouldn't be surprised by, by very bizarre jobs numbers either. No, and uh, I'd really like to see him make good on that uh, college graduate uh, promise as well. <laughs> yeah. That's amazing. Don't hold your breath. Yeah. In an attempt to show his concern for the farmers that were hit by, the, or that are still being hit by the devastating drought that has swept 78% of the country, Romney decided, here's a good idea. I'm going to have a photo op with an Iowa farmer. Now, the Iowa farmer that was lucky enough to be chosen was Lamar Koth. Now, Koth isn't exactly the rugged, down-home farmer who's struggling to keep his operation going that you might expect. Or actually, I'm, I'm even already misspeaking. His operations, all 54 of them, according to the Des Moines Register, Koth owns 54 soy and corn farms, and that's just one of his jobs. He also is a, uh, he's a millionaire, he's a real estate mogul, he's a former concert promoter who booked huge acts in his 24,000 square foot event center, and he also, like most farmers in Iowa, he lives in a spaceship house. It doesn't have a car elevator like Mitt Romney's house, but it does have a car wash, which I guess is pretty good just for a rugged farmer suffering from the drought. When you bring your truck back covered in mud, you know, it's, it's good to have that. Now, also, if you want to talk about did he build it himself, according to the numbers, I, I mean, I just can't even believe the Romney campaign is this stupid. According to numbers from the EWG Farm Subsidies Database, Koth has received over $130,000 in conservation payments from the federal government. Now, conservation payments, which are about $5 billion a year in spending total, are usually used by the government to get farmers not to grow crops. What's the point of this? Alter demand, stabilize prices, sometimes to preserve land. Capitalism at its best, isn't it, Lewis? You, the government paying farmers not to grow crops, and then that guy gets hand-selected by Romney for a visit. I, I mean, you've got to be out of your mind. Yeah, but who knows what other government money he's receiving. Uh, farmers are able to receive all sorts of money from the government. It's not just for conservation payments. No question, but uh, and just the conservation payments alone are hilarious because, of course, the guy built it all himself. Right. But really, Mitt, out of the hundreds of thousands of farmers being impacted by the drought, many of them people struggling to keep their homes, to even keep their farms at all, you had to go and meet with the millionaire real estate mogul who lives in a spaceship house with an underwater car wash, there's nothing worse that he could have done. This, this has to be the worst possible farmer to go meet for Mitt Romney. But it was probably an easy one. He's probably a, a contributor. He was probably comfortable there, no question. No doubt. I love this picture, by the way, that we're putting up there of Mitt in the cornfield. He's like, oh, so this is where the children of the corn come from. That then, it, it's shedding so much light for Mitt Romney, figuring out all sorts of stuff. Yeah, brilliant. It's, I mean, not as bad as the shopping thing. No. But uh, pretty bad. But silly. My heart was warmed by Newt Gingrich's loving comments about his party's presidential nominee, saying he doesn't particularly dislike Newt Gingrich as a person. He doesn't particularly dislike Newt Gingrich as a person. I think I have the video here, Lewis. Let's take a look at it. No, I don't. Why don't you go ahead and play it for us, Lewis? Let me ask you about the tough part of this thing, Ken. Why is it that people who run against Romney, and maybe this is just politics, you've been in so long, they don't like him afterwards. I mean, you've said some tough things, you know, but they are, you can't forget what you've said. People like Huckabee, he seems like such a pleasant guy. He really despises him. He says he has no soul. <laughs> uh, you see this everywhere. Uh, uh, Rudy Giuliani didn't like him, really got nasty about him. What is it? Is it his wealth, his looks? No, he's is there not. something that really bugs people about his, his, his rivalry? Well, let me say, first of all, I think that, that Mitt and I get along fine. We get a lot of stuff done together, <laughs> and I don't particularly dislike him as a person. I, I, don't like that I don't particularly dislike him as a person. That word particularly certainly has a lot of meaning, doesn't it? Yeah, yeah. And, I mean, the whole thing is just chock full of, of uh, alternate meanings. I mean, I don't particularly dislike him as, as a person. As a person. <laughs> Meaning, I dislike him as a person, but we are able to get some political stuff done. What a ringing endorsement from Newt Gingrich for Mitt Romney. Unbelievable. Uh, I mean, but let's, let's be clear. Newt Gingrich didn't particularly like many of his ex-wives either. So Newt Gingrich just seems in general to be maybe 
some kind a of a bitter luke, person, a, a bitter, lukewarm type of cold guy when it comes to uh, other people in his life, period. Full stop. I don't know. Yeah. All right. Let's take a break. Facebook.com slash David Pakman show. We'll be back. We'll talk to Gary Creep about uh, Chick-fil-A, First Amendment confusion and plenty of other stuff. And then later I'll tell you about a Kansas doctor who's being criticized for not forcing a 10 year old rape victim to have a kid. Disturbing. The David Pakman Show at davidpakman.com. Welcome back to The David Pakman Show. Joining me is Gary Creep. He is president and executive director of the United States Justice Foundation. Gary, thanks for joining us. Let's talk a little bit about the discussion about the First Amendment surrounding Chick-fil-A, the ACLU, and, and discussions of what exactly is the right to free speech. Give me your sense of what First Amendment implications there are on both sides with the Chick-fil-A uh, uh, anti-gay statements that have been made and the response to those statements and maybe that'll be a good starting point for us. Well, I, there's nothing anti-gay about what the statements that uh, the president of Chick-fil-A, Mr. C uh, Kathy said. Uh, he said that, uh, that among other things that God was going to bring judgment down in the United States for uh, the way that we've been shaking our fist at God what's going on with same-sex marriage, what's going on with abortion, and he has every right to say that. Uh, the uh, so the intolerant people on the left, both those in the homosexual movement and those on the just the hardcore left, <clears throat> of course, don't accept free speech by anyone that disagrees with them, and so they immediately lashed out. And we have the specter of Rahm Emanuel, the former chief of staff for Mr. Obama for two and a half, three years, who's currently near Chicago saying, well, Chick-fil-A's values are not Chicago's values. The irony of that is that uh, Mr. Manuel just made a public uh, act of embracing the black Muslim group in Chicago and asking for their assistance. So apparently uh, Chicago's values are anti-Semitism, racism against whites, anti-Christian. Okay, but hold on a second, Gary. No, I, I, let's, I wanna, just to take it a step at a time, just for clarity for our audience, I actually, I didn't think that anybody was denying that Chick-fil-A had an anti-gay stance. I'm actually, I didn't even think we were going to go down that route. I thought we were going to talk about First Amendment. But so you don't believe that, that Chick-fil-A has done anything anti-gay by indicating that they believe that homosexuality is something that is wrong, that God, God is going to punish. Aside from the First Amendment implications, you happen to think that nothing anti-gay was indicated by Chick-fil-A. That's right. I mean, he's quoting from the Bible. That's what the Bible says. And uh, so, tell me again. What what was he quoting from the Bible? What does the Bible say? Well, the Bible says he in quotes from the Bible saying that homosexuality uh, was a, an abomination. Although that's what the Bible does say. But he said that we're shaking our fist at God. We're just saying, you know, basically, screw you, God. We're going to run our country the way we want. We don't care about uh, biblical rules and biblical ideals. We're just going to uh, do whatever we want. Now, uh, it's been acknowledged that there's absolutely no evidence that uh, Chick-fil-A has ever discriminated against uh, any uh, homosexuals or anybody uh, of any persuasion, uh, religious or, other, or sexual orientation or religion or political or otherwise. Yeah, see, the uh, problem have, I have, uh, Gary, extreme, is... They have an extremely good reputation for their relationship with their employees. Okay, so the problem I have is that so quickly when someone comes out and, and says... I'm offended by what Chick-fil-A is saying. I find it to be anti-gay, whatever the case may be. There's people on the right who start saying that Chick-fil-A's First Amendment rights have been in some way violated. This is the same thing that we saw. Remember Dr. Laura Schlesinger when she came out with this N-word lace rant on her show and then people were offended and they stopped listening to her. She said she had to leave her show to regain her First Amendment rights. People seem to somehow confuse the right to freedom of speech with uh, freedom from the consequences of speech that some find offensive. And that's, that's particularly a confusion we're seeing on the right. Well, but that's not a confusion. I mean, uh, for instance, a number of years ago, I was on the San Diego City Human Relations Commission, which was an entity set up to enforce the uh, gay rights ordinance in the city of San Diego. And because I spoke out and supported the Boy Scouts, I got so many death threats 
uh, that I had to have police protection. I didn't request it. San Diego City Council requested it. And this is the, what happens is that people on the right, Christians speak out and they get death threats and they get harassment. I mean, okay, but very, that, that's, that's I, different let, though, let, let Gary. I, I have finish, to stop let, you there let though. Me, no, let me finish. Mom, okay. Okay, go ahead. You, asked, you asked me a question. The very idea that several mayors would say that they're not going to allow Chick-fil-A to have franchises in their cities because of comments made by the owner of Chick-fil-A is outrageous. How many cities have 100% employment? How many cities don't need new jobs coming in? Ignore for a moment the constitutional rights. Uh, I mean, that's just ridiculous, number one. Number two, any city now of these, that's uh, Atlanta, San Francisco, Washington, D.C., Boston, New York, yeah. any of these cities that now turn down a franchise application is going to be a, a de facto assumption and a legitimate assumption in law that they've been denied because of restraints on freedom of speech having nothing to do with the merits of the application. And That's so they just fine. opened okay. up their I, I city to but all sorts of lawsuits. What I, want, I, I think we're starting to conflate two issues. You're absolutely right that if a mayor were to prevent Chick-fil-A from coming in simply based on the statement they made about their position on gay rights and ACLU attorneys, as you've indicated, are in agreement, that would be a violation of the First Amendment. However, that being said, I'm talking about something else, which is this idea that we see time and time again from the right, which is when someone gets offended at something that has been said from a Christian God point of view, as you indicated, being offended by something like that, being offended by saying, hey, it's just the word of God that homosexuality is wrong, and then not patronizing that business or whatever it is, the First Amendment says nothing about uh, someone being offended by someone else's speech. It has nothing to do with violating anyone's First Amendment rights, much as we saw with Dr. Laura. The mayor's thing is something else, but you're mixing the two here. Well, I was actually trying to answer your question. By the way, Dr. Laura is a personal friend of mine. And have been for many years. I did. Uh, I was on the pilot uh, of her tele one of the two pilots for a television program. That's great. And when my uh, wife was uh, Carol was terminally ill, they did a live segment from my house. And they did a host. They did a program on death and di death and dying. Right. So and, what uh, you would agree said, yeah. then that when people were offended by what Dr. Laura said and then they stopped listening, that didn't violate Dr. Laura's First Amendment rights, did it? Not at all. Not at all. Not at all. So then why are, we conf why are we saying that someone being offended by what Chick-fil-A has said and they're not going to go there, how is that a violation of the First Amendment? If we're only focusing on the mayors, then I understand what you're saying. If they were to reject a Chick-fil-A application, that would be cause for concern. But simply stating that they would prefer Chick-fil-A not come to their town, politically you may disagree with it, you might make the jobs argument. I agree with you on that, Gary. But to say that simply stating they would prefer Chick-fil-A stay away from their city, that is not a violation of the First Amendment. But that's not what they said. What they said is we're not going to allow them to be in our city. And a government official saying that, that's, now that's where you get into violations because government authorities do not have the right to pick and choose who can open a business based upon the religious beliefs of, of the CEO of the business. Now, yeah, but Gary, they didn't, they didn't yeah, no, use... Just a second. There's a difference between the CEO saying it. The company has no formal position on this, by the way. It was the CEO saying that, okay? And the company has publicly stated they have no public position. On this issue. I understand. It's the CEO saying that. And, and I guess my, the distinction I'm trying to make is uh, the, the actual wording was not we will not allow. The actual wording was not we would prefer not. It was somewhere in between. It was something like I would recommend Chick-fil-A not try to get. Well, my point is though, until an application <clears throat> is denied, until Chick-fil-A is kept out, there's, there's actually no real grievance here. Well, uh, yes, in one sense, but in another sense, serious. let me tell you what's going on. The New York City Council cha chairman ha is trying to pressure New York City University or New York University to kick Chick-fil-A out. There are people trying to force uh, Southern Mississippi to kick Chick-fil-A out, and these are government officials. And them doing that, that has First Amendment implications okay. because you're punishing someone because of their religious beliefs. Now, if the Chick-fil-A chairman was a Muslim, everybody in the world would be screaming, oh, you're anti-Muslim discrimination, you're terrible, blah, blah, blah. But because uh, Mr. Uh, Cathy's statements were Christian, well, there's except for the ACLU and groups like mine, the United States Justice Foundation, there's no, no, no uproar.
Okay, well, that, that's of course getting into uh, th this idea that the war on Christians exists, but that's unfortunately something we which don't have true. time for today, which I know you think does and I think doesn't, but we'll have to keep that conversation for a different day. Uh, Gary Creep, President and Executive Director of the United States Justin Fa Justice Foundation. We're not agreeing on much, but I'm glad for the civil conversation. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you for having me on your show, and God bless. Okay, thank you. The David Pakman Show at davidpakman.com. The David Pakman Show at davidpakman.com. Please go to davidpakman.com slash membership and get a David Pakman Show membership. Not only will you get the bonus show hosted and produced by producer Louis Motomedy, you'll also get the David Pakman Show member call-ins for members only. We're actually having one after today's show, a roundtable discussion. Members will be able to call in, ask questions. We'll all be here hanging out. That's happening today for members only, davidpakman.com slash membership. A Kansas doctor is under attack for not forcing a 10-year-old rape victim to give birth. Shocking, isn't it, Lewis? No, no, not in Kansas. Dr. Ann Newhouse bravely took up the cause of women's rights, and bravely, I say, because Christian jihadist Scott Rader murdered Dr. George Tiller in 2009. Now Dr. Newhouse might actually lose her license for the, quote, sin of not forcing a mentally ill 10-year-old to carry her uncle's baby to term. This story, you get kind of desensitized to these stories, Lewis, when you read about them time after time. And then when you really step back and think about it, it's, it's literally sickening that this woman is being criticized for not forcing this girl to have her uncle's child at age 10. Yeah. It's obviously, it's like, a, it's like a mechanism to become desensitized to this stuff because if yeah. we didn't, it would just be overwhelming. There are people in Kansas who think it is proper that a 10-year-old who was raped and impregnated by a family member and has mental illness should be forced to have a child. Who would raise that child then? Well, they would say you, she would uh, give it up for adoption, ad adoption. She's 10, okay? And countless indications that even having a baby in this state at age 10 would cause incredible trauma that if she's lucky in the rest of her life she might be able to maybe start to recover from physical trauma as well physical trauma as well no question about it now the kansas medical board includes a former lawyer for operation rescue which is a anti-abortion really an anti-choice group produced an a quote expert that testified that abortion can never be considered to have a positive impact on a patient's mental health and therefore Dr. Newhouse's opinion that the best possible outcome for this 10-year-old uh, uh, child would be to have an abortion can't possibly be right. Of course that's not the point being argued. What we're talking about here is what would be the least bad. Not, what, not, not would an abortion be wonderful with waterfalls and flowers and cinnamon, right? Unicorns, we're not talking about yeah. that. We're talking about the least disastrous situation and in this case it is not for the 10 year old girl to have her uncle's child which uh, uh she uh, after a a rape impregnation it's just not no not not the logical solution it's we can't even really use the term pro-life anymore i haven't been using it for a while but now it really should just be called conscripted gestation that's really what we're talking about here when it comes to uh, pregnancy and the religious right uh, that's a mouthful i mm -hmm. mean i think i think i think anti-choice well, doesn't have really the same connotation. No, and many times anti-choice is anti-life. Yes. We did a story several months ago about a man who had a stroke and turned gay. Now we have, uh, this isn't a news story, but I've come across an article on psychology professor Warren Throckmorton's website, wthrockmorton.com, and it discusses an inverse story. It's a couple of years old. It's about a 57-year-old right-handed man who had a stroke at the age of 45, and it resulted in um, basically complete recovery as far as the physical symptoms within three months. The patient was, um, was gay his whole life, and he had become aware of that orientation in his early teens. He had several gay partners, etc. After the stroke, he found himself to be heterosexual. He just said, I'm, 
I'm attracted to women now after, his, uh, after the second stroke that he had, actually. This is interesting because, again, it is another indication that sexual orientation is not something that is environmental, but is rather a, uh, it's something you are born with and it is something in the brain. Why else is this interesting? Natal? Well, I think that uh, people who want to keep believing that, you know, homosexuality is the result of an abnormal brain function um, could still think that after this. They could just think that this person had an abnormal functioning before the hemorrhagic stroke or whatever he had, and after it, it somehow normalized the functioning of that part of the brain due to just chance. Right, so the anti-gay nuts are going to say, if someone is straight, has a stroke, and turns gay, they'll say, well, listen, you had a stroke and now you're gay. Obviously, the stroke messed up your brain. But, but if you're gay and then turn straight, they'll say, well, strokes are complicated, strange things, and whatever problems he had as a result of the stroke the part that controls his sexual orientation was fixed as a result of the stroke. Exactly. It's brilliant, really. But, but you see, if, if they're admitting that someone can turn gay or turn straight as a result of a stroke... You're, you're admitting that it's in the brain. You're admitting that it's in the brain and that and you since, have no hey, control. And, and since when do we discriminate against people based on things that are caused simply by their brain? We don't, right? right? If, if, if you admit yeah. that this is possible and that this actually happened, you are, you are basically denying that it's a choice. Um, so, I mean, and these people are usually anti-science. Right. So they, uh, you know, I'm sure a lot of them will still argue that it is a choice, but you can't have both. No, you certainly can't have both, but they'll figure out a way to have both, no question. Right, and just one more point on that. The way they could argue that it's still a choice is by saying that you make the choice and your brain changes to reflect that choice <laughs> after, the, after a while of having the behavior. I love it. Or even though you're feeling these things now, you can't act on them. Right. All right. Well, there it is. Yet another story. Let's get to some of your voicemail and email. The voicemail line, 24 hours a day at 219-2DAVID-P. Here is a voicemail about producer Lewis trying the Argentinian mate that Natan brought in. Let's take a listen to this one. Hey guys, checking in from uh, Salt Lake City. Uh, Lewis, give uh, give the mate another try, but uh, this time, <laughs> make less, uh, you guys need to let him use some sugar. Um, most Americans that like mate are going to put sugar in it, and uh, most of the Argentines I drink it with are putting sugar in it. So just before you put the water in, uh, you know, put just a, a quarter teaspoon of sugar, just a small amount of sugar on top. This voicemail, by the way, being let, delivered via a CB radio of some kind. The sugar before it hits the yoga, and then, um, and then drink it. Uh, and then also, you know, as far as like carrying it around, you know, actually we do carry ours around with a little uh, hot water dispenser style thermos with the pump on top, works real great. But who knew that this was happening in Salt Lake City, Natan? Is it true, though, that even uh, people in Argentina tend to put sugar in it? Uh, it's not true that... Um, I don't have any statistics on it. I know people... We, we both know people there who do and people who don't. I was showing Louis the authentic uh, Argentine gaucho way of drinking it that, you know, predated using sugar, probably. Uh, but yeah, you can, of course, uh, use sugar. And also, I'm going to show Louis... I don't know if we want to do it on the air, but... Another dr related drink called terere, which is the uh, cold mate that they drink in, you know, the north of Argentina, Paraguay, and Brazil, which is, you know, ice cold lemonade or orange juice with mate, very cold with ice cubes. That's another popular drink. That'll be a spin-off show, though. That'll, that'll include, um, exactly. you know, other, other uh, yeah. The, sugar, trying the to... sugar's a good suggestion, though. I'm sure that would uh, enhance it, if you will. All right. On Mitt Romney's uh, incredibly staged shop grocery shopping trip, at the drugstore, he's buying three packages of Sudafed and making a batch of meth in the servant, servant's bathtub. Well, of course, we have no evidence of that. If you do, I would love to see it, though. That would be an interesting segment. Indeed. And next, they're going to have a video of Mitt's wife washing dishes and dusting. You know, I still don't, you know why they wouldn't do that? Because that's even more obviously inauthentic. Right. And on the low IQ execution in Texas, Dennis wrote me, he said, I was listening to the podcast, heard you, heard you talk about Texas executing the man with a very low IQ. It amazes me that so many Republicans are so afraid of the government ruining, uh, running their health care, but have no problem with the same government executing their fellow citizens. Yeah, government can't figure out a way to run yeah. health care. But, but they can figure out who's guilty yeah. and who to kill. Let's not, let's not privatize uh, the judicial system. <laughs> no, that, no. That, of course not. All right, that's it for today. 
Bonus show, davidpackman.com slash membership. Great, great stuff on today's bonus show. We'll see you tomorrow. The David Pakman Show at davidpackman.com.